Welcome back to the best podcast in the world. We also talk about fitness, but we're just the best on all things. Anyway, and we're very confident, apparently. Here's the giveaway for today, the New Year's Extreme Fitness Bundle. This gives you nine months of exercise programming, multiple workout programs put together for free, video demos, everything, and it's on sale right now as well for other people. We'll get to that in just a second, but we're going to give it away for free to one of you lucky viewers. Here's what you got to do to enter. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all those things, and if we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to that amazing bundle. Okay, now everyone else, we have that bundle, which is for advanced people. We also have one for intermediate people and one for beginners, so there's three different bundles, all of them hugely discounted. Over $300 of savings on all these bundles, all of them nine months of exercise programming. Uh, so go check them out. Find one that works for you. Sign up, and now you got the next nine months planned out for you. You can find all of them at mapsjanuary.com. Also, if you just want to try one MAPS program to see what all the hubbub is about, uh, try out MAPS Anabolic. It's the flagship program. That one is 50% off right now. So go to mapsred.com and then use the code JANUARY50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Look, the current body acceptance movement is harming people's health. All right. Ooh, I like when you Let's bring, what do bring you fire. Mean? Let's talk about uh, the current body acceptance movement. So the current body acceptance movement, by the way, I understand why it exists. It is a extreme reaction to the body, I guess, shaming uh, that the fitness um, media industry, the popular fitness diet and health industry did for so long. Mm -hmm. So what they do, what they're doing is they're trying to, to fight that, which is saying, if you're not lean, if you're not super ripped, if you don't look super sexy, you're worthless, you're dumb, whatever. And they're trying to fight it with, hey, if you're really overweight, that's healthy. If you're really overweight, accept it. It's great. It's wonderful. It's healthy. It's, it's not bad, which I think is just an equally ridiculous, just opposite end of the spectrum message. Now, this was inspired from yet another, is it a magazine that put on the cover? Yeah, I think fitness? we were all tagged to get on this, right? It was It's Self Magazine. So Self, Self magazine, magazine made this, this pivot, I think, about a year and a half, two years ago, and they're doubling and tripling down on uh woke fitness here right and trying to and they're and the, what they're highlighting is and I, and fitness sal's right like this is a this is a reaction fair too right totally fair for us to react to the decades of poor messaging coming from the fitness space focusing yes. completely on how we look and it's out news is out all these people that have six-pack abs and look amazing on some of these other magazines are not that healthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They look good, but they're not technically healthy. A lot of dysfunction there, yeah. too. Yeah, tons of dysfunction. Many of them are taking steroids, like you name it. Extreme maybe, a lot of them are maybe good mm -hmm. people. They got all kinds of insecurities. Okay, news is out. We know that. We've been saying that forever. So here is the... The overcorrection to yes. that is okay. Well, if that's true, then the let's extreme overcorrection. Like, when are we going to get anywhere close to the middle yeah. again? By the way, hating yourself uh, or hating your body can look like both, right? Can look like either. Lots of people in our space, uh, and I know I've worked in fitness forever. So, and I, I've said this before people who work in our space, a higher percentage of them uh, are, have eating disorders and dysfunctional relationships with their bodies than the average population. Um, but you can hate your body and become so obsessed with that that you don't have good relationships, you do things that harm your body, you over-exercise, you over-diet just to look a particular way, never satisfied, always hating yourself. On the other end of the spectrum, you could also disregard your health, use food <laughs> as a drug, as a way to medicate yourself, as a way to, uh, to bury your feelings, not paying attention to the, the poor health effects that those things cause. You become very obese as a result. Um, it's it's really the same thing, just different. It really is. It's just and the other end. It is, and it, we have to be. There's there's nothing wrong with honesty. So there's nothing wrong with saying being obese, regardless of any other factor. This is a fact. Being obese has negative health uh, impacts on on you. It's got negative health effects, and lead what leads to obesity are dysfunctional behaviors, or mm -hmm. behaviors that aren't healthy or good for you. And oftentimes, look, the most abused drug in America, I'll make this argument all day long, is food. Uh, food, by far, if it were a drug, it would be categorized at the top 
in terms of damage. Well, ignoring the reality of of what uh, you know, uh, obesity, morbid, morbidly obese uh, individuals face is just not a, a, a service that is providing anybody any kind of value. We have to get beyond feelings and and we have to get beyond all this stuff and get back to like really just trying to focus on helping people get back to a healthy body again so i'm, I'm always torn on responding to these things like we all got tagged on this i get tagged on, on post or magazine articles uh like this all the time and a lot of times i don't even comment or respond and it's not because i don't have an opinion on it or i don't think it's ridiculous or get me fired up or whatever but the truth is i don't think self magazine is stupid i think they probably recognize exactly what we're saying but they don't give a fuck because they're in the business of people talking eyeballs about Bro, that's a big market if you yeah. you if you consider almost 40 percent of america yeah but it's 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 placating it's not fucking it's not them seriously getting behind and supporting no. it's that it will it will sell more magazines <clears throat> to a demographic that maybe was not buying self magazines before, and it will get the other side. So maybe the the group that was originally reading and then doesn't like the message talking about it, mm -hmm. and it'll get fitness people like us fired up and sharing it. Otherwise, yeah. I was I haven't fucking talked about self magazine ever in, before. Oh yeah, I didn't know that the last was two a times magazine. they've done these type of you know cover of a magazine mm -hmm. and and headlines. So I, I sometimes I. I avoid talking about it or getting involved in it because i don't want to give i don't want to feel the uh feel the fire anymore yeah. it's like that's really what they're looking totally. for it's the same thing why uh you know cnn loves donald trump and why freaking fox yeah. why, loves why radical liberal screaming office. you know fucking woke yeah. kids like it's yeah. just they 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 as much as they talk bad about it they love it, it because gets them it gives them attention right yeah. so sometimes i think that that's what this play is really about it's you know, it's this massive virtue signaling thing that really doesn't matter that much because at the end of the day, if it sells more magazines or it gets more millions of people talking about them, they win. Well, well there's no weight to it. It's not helping anybody. It's just, uh, again, yeah, it's just serving a, you know, certain person like. Um, yeah, it's just noise. It's just right. noise. Yeah, some to either argue about or justify. Yep. You know, like somebody's feelings. Yeah. Obesity is the result of a dysfunctional relationship with yourself uh, and with food. Okay. That's the result of it. So it's, it would be no different than a magazine showing an alcoholic and saying, this is healthy. <clears throat> this is me loving myself. Right. It's not. It's not. So you can be honest. That doesn't mean you should hate yourself. It also doesn't mean you shouldn't be empathetic, but you should be honest. Now, I, I agree with you, Adam, but there's another side to it is 40% of Americans are obese. A pretty big chunk of that 40% have tried diets, are sick and tired of the diet industry, the fitness industry, which now has been around at large for at least three or four decades. And so you're, if you're the person putting this magazine out, you're like, here is a segment of the market that will buy this. They'll love this message. They'll love the, that we're telling them, don't change anything. It's totally fine. It's all good. This is you caring about yourself. And I'm going to be honest, if I'm the person that hated my body for 15 years and I was told to do crazy diets and, you know, to, to overtrain myself and it to hate my body. It resonates with you. I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, thank God. Yeah, of course. Somebody said yeah. something like this, right? And oh my gosh, look, someone's on the cover that looks like me. And so I get it. I that, get well, that, that's on. also why it's hard for me to, and I did though, I still, I took the bait and I still commented on that stupid post. Um but I hesitate to do it because I also know that that exact person is following that page yeah. and feels that way. And me being the fitness guy, that's who why comes you have to be over, very it's not going to reach them. Yeah. Well, well not only like that, but I'll turn them off. I'll well, turn that I mean. person off. You're not exactly why I don't like these guys. Because because then I then I get auto automatically pushed into the fat shaming category because yeah. I can't because I can't objectively look at it and say no, that's not health. Yeah. This person is not any more healthy than the person you're talking about who has any other addiction. It just happens to be food, and you're trying to justify it that way, and you're getting away with justifying that way because unfortunately. My people, my fitness, my fitness, you know, group of people mm -hmm. have fucked this industry for so long and have forced you in this position. And so this is the this is the uh, repercussions well, of that. I'm glad you said that, yeah. because if you do work in the fitness and health space and this is largely talking to coaches and trainers, because I, I believe that a majority of them, coaches and trainers have a deep passion for helping people. If this is you and you really are in fitness to help people. Right. So it's not this. Um, narcissistic reason or whatever. You actually want to help people. 
when you comment on stuff like this and when you talk about this, be careful. Don't just rally the other fitness people that want to hear you say how bad it is, but rather understand that you're communicating to people that need to hear this message in an empathetic, understanding way and in a way that's going to help them. Because otherwise what you'll do is you'll radicalize them even further. But I think we should always speak out. We just got to be smart about it. And why do we got to always speak out? Because this type of mentality is a cancer. The mentality that says take no responsibility and it's everyone else's fault and it's all great. This mentality spreads like wildfire. It is alluring to people, ultimately damaging, but initially alluring. And it spreads like crazy. And then to counter it, is difficult because the second you counter it, you're labeled a fat shamer. Oh, you just are shaming fat people. It's like, oh, and it's hard to, like, how do I counter that? No, I'm not. What's, and then you're on yeah. the defense, right? So we have to speak out on this because, just like we speak out on the other bad messaging, and I feel so bad because the a majority of people struggle with this. So, you know, it's a, again, it's a majority of us struggle with this. Oh my gosh, they're getting bombarded from all angles with terrible messaging. Like, I, I, when we started the podcast, remember when we first met, we were at your house, Adam, mm -hmm. and I think I said something like 95% or more of the information that's being sold or given to people in regards to weight loss or health and fitness is terrible. I remember you guys agreeing, and that's true. It's like most, most of the, so it's like- Well, it's, in, it's what inspired the content that we produce, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Was, it, uh, we knew that there, <laughs> which is what, it's like how I answer too when people ask like, how have you guys done 1,700 episodes and aren't you already afraid to run out of content? I'm like, no, as long as the fitness place keeps fucking pu pushing out garbage information, oh, so we've much, always yeah. got something to counter. They give us well, so much just, <laughs> Oh, God, it's just so frustrating, though. I, I swear to God, if, if I could just take like the last two, three years worth of content any of these publications has put out and just put it in a dumpster and set it on fire, mm -hmm. like, that would be the move. <laughs> it, yeah. That would be a big fire. Yeah. There's a lot of garbage out there, but it's very sad. It's very sad because if I were in that person's shoes and I didn't know any better, I would fall for it. I would, I would feel as terrible as I have, as I would have felt having failed at my attempts. Well, that's why I feel like it should anger you though. It should anger you as a fitness professional, even if it is like, um, you know, it's just contrary to good information. It's not good information to, to provide people. And you do have to approach it with, you know, soft it's, gloves because you know, who's again, paying attention you're who you're trying to, you're actually trying to reach. help people. And it's, it's manipulating. But it does make me angry. It's manipulating people the same way, uh, that when the fitness industry says things like you're no good cause you're fat, you're unattractive, you have no value, you know, they, they prey on your insecurities. It's just as manipulative. It's no different. It's just a different angle, yeah. but it's extremely I mean, manipulative. It gets, it gets me fired up and passionate, but I don't get angry over it. I mean, the truth is uh, it, it provides opportunity for us, to be completely honest, right? So if if, uh, if all the information out there was good or aligned with what we talk about, we wouldn't have much of a job. Uh, we live in a free country, right? uh, at least right now we do. Uh, and so it, it, it's not like this is a government mandated way of thinking. And so everybody has to, then that would make me a lot more angry. And it, it, I have the opportunity to have a, a smarter, louder, better voice. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I don't get too upset about it. Yes, I can get passionate and fired up <clears throat> over topics like this because I, I see so many sheep and people being fooled by it. But I don't get that mad. I mean, it's uh, we have the ability to be able to counter that message in with what what we do today. So yeah, it's the long game. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it is what. Yeah, it, it's you know, the, the short reactions never really do much, right? It's it's about being consistent. And the angry reactions. You're right, Adam. The angry like you know, it's your responsibility. Go do it. You're lazy. No. <laughs> you are not helping anybody. You yeah, got to do this. Just the as right you're, way. I feel like you're just as guilty, right? Though yeah, on that yeah. side, you know, it's maybe not the best transition, but it does remind me of the the post that Gary V just did about money. Um, he was asked recently about um, his definition of success, and he kind of went on this little rant about how fucked up we have it as, as a nation right now, like this idea of what how we measure and 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 say success is. And he went in to talk about like statistically what the one percenters are as far as revenue, so that. And he says, you know, the crazy part is, you know, I've got I've got plenty of friends at all spectrums, friends that are making thirty, sixty thousand dollars a year and a hundred grand a year, to friends that are making millions and millions of dollars. And he goes. I know more unhappy, depressed, fucking, you know, multimillionaires than I do people that make 60 grand to, and he goes, I know people that are unbelievably happy in life 
making 90 grand, 80, 90 grand a year and so like that. So this, this idea of like what we've painted the picture of success and what it's supposed to look like is yeah. so, so flawed. It's also with beauty. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Arthur Brooks told me this. He said, if you <clears throat> were on a scale of one to 10, a five in terms of beauty, and you devoted all your time and resources to get yourself from a five to a nine. So you're going from the middle to like, you're one of the most beautiful people. He says that your happiness would increase by something like uh, like less than 5%, or something like that, say like 3% increase. And that, it aligns the same with money, right? It does, and, uh, and studies will show that. If your basic needs are, net, needs are met and you're not struggling, past a certain point, it doesn't provide any additional uh, value or happiness. And we, it, it's funny, we place all of our eggs in the baskets of money, you know, beauty, uh, material items, stuff like that. When those are, they're not very valuable in terms of happiness. They really aren't. I would make the this. same case for chasing like aesthetics too. That's the transition I was looking for in that, bringing that up. And what you're saying is just that, you know, we had this idea of, of having this crazy ripped, you know, cover of a magazine, you know, 20 years ago is like just the ultimate. But how many people do you know that have you know sacrificed so much to get their body to look that, whether it be taking drugs or being like in a, you know, not going out or doing anything for a year, two years, which is would be a lot of these competitors and stuff like that to, to look this way. And they're unhappy and miserable. So that's I under I, I do get the movement on the like, yeah. by the way, sometimes people are rich. And sometimes people are ripped because they're unhappy. In other words, that's right. They're trying to fix their unhappiness. They're medicating with it. Yes, they're they're medicating with fitness. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's exactly what I saw when I got into competing. That blew my mind. Was I really did not expect that? I really thought that when I got behind stage and I got a chance to meet all these, the you know, the one percent in the you know, it's like thinking that like you're getting the back room with all the millionaires, right? Yeah. Like, man, I can't wait to pick their brains and hear what they have to say for advice, and then realizing, oh my god. They're all miserable. Yeah, yeah. Or they all have terrible advice, or like, I know. you know, what I'm saying like that's what it felt like when I got back there with all these competitors that had these incredible physiques. I just thought, oh my god, most of, most of these kids back here are just they have incredible discipline and sacrifice, and they've been able to do it for years on years, but they're miserable inside, mm. and their way of going about it is awful. And if that is what success looks like, I want nothing here, to do with here's it. Here's what the what the irony is. Uh, if you if you do become wealthy, the it, the process is what can make you ha happy, not the money, right? So it's very different winning money versus learning how to build wealth through following a passion or doing something that you feel is meaningful. In that case, the process is what makes you makes you happy. Same thing with fitness. It's not the goal. It's not that you're looking a particular way that makes you happy, but rather the pursuit. Is, as long as it's healthy, right? If it's a healthy pursuit. It's the pursuit that provides uh, a lot of the happiness that you may get. You know, it's funny. I just, uh, somebody sent me, so there's a website called uh, statista.com where you can look up statistics. Mm. You guys want to hear something crazy? This is, a, this is this is the average weight gain reported by U.S. Oh, adults. Oh, I just saw somebody post this. Is that true? The, the Like the 40 pounds in the millennials this okay. last year? Is that what so you're going to report? Average weight gain, average weight gain reported by U.S. adults during the COVID-19 pandemic as of 2021. So- as of February 2021, by demographic, you guys ready for this? Yeah, okay. this is the one I think. All U.S. adults, 29 pounds. That's the average. Uh, men, wow. 37 pounds. Women, 22 pounds. Uh, people aged 18 to 24, 28 pounds. Millennials, which are 25 to 42. I didn't know I was a millennial. We're all millennials in here. Do you guys know that? Yeah, they, no, try, you know, they keep stretching. They keep recategorizing yeah. it. Quit trying to push us into that category. Yeah. I know. I know. It, <laughs> says, <laughs> it says, it says, don't you remember everybody that was giving me shit when I was talking because I, I talk know. about the millennial thing all the time? They're like, oh, technically Adam's a millennial. I know. So, <laughs> so well, we're on the cusp between yeah. millennials and, nah, and Generation no, X. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, millennials, 41 pounds. Generation Xers, 21 pounds. Boomers, 16 pounds. And then it goes on and on. And yes, the average person you know, how gained 41 pounds how interesting 41 is that like one pounds technically boomers should have gained more right if you look at all the other studies that are about like hormones and the ability to build muscle and to lose weight at, at, as you get older and stuff like that but ironically you know why i think they gained the least i have a theory because i saw that at first and i was like wait a minute what how did older people gain less than people who well are like my theory 40? my theory would be i'll wait to hear your my, my theory would be that it, uh the mm -hmm. millennials had the most dramatic shift in their lifestyle yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. right exactly. so like if you're a millennial you're still young maybe you're playing sports and doing active things yep. and getting out there and doing things and then or just going to work yeah. right yeah just active right you're way more active because you're in your 20s and early 30s 
and boomers are probably kind of you know there's half of them are retired like life didn't change much you know? right. i don't really go that many many places anyway. yeah yeah so that would be my prediction that's what i thought that's what i thought too i thought that people who are already retired eh, don't really change a whole lot plus it took like my my mom mm-hmm. like half the pandemic to figure out how she could order groceries and food to her house you know what i'm saying so she was still going <laughs> yeah, so it took <laughs> <laughs> so still that's took, a good point you know, who's, who's millennials are on it right away millennials yeah. like oh my god there's an app for this oh my god there's an app yeah. for that and they had it all figured out by week week one they already had the oculus yeah, boom, boomers were like boomers up. like what you could have yeah. your food delivered so th- so this is <laughs> yeah. another statistic that i think will will uh will support the theory that we're going to see a huge influx of gym goers and interest in fitness in this first quarter uh of 2022 so this massive weight gain which is I believe it's two or three times faster or more than what we normally see, if not higher. They didn't have kids on this, by the way. That would have scared. I bet you if we saw children, mm-hmm. I bet you that really would have scared people. And anybody um, who has digital fitness programs is going to yeah. do really well. Huh? Anybody who has yeah. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. You're just going to put it out there. I like your predictions, right? <laughs> your I know. Just throw that in the pot. I know, dude. It's so, it's so sad. But yeah, I think, I think you're right because a lot of the people in that age group, their work said stay home. Yeah, that's my guess. And then they just ordered food yeah. and they watched Netflix uh-huh. and they didn't go anywhere. And I wonder if... I, you know, logically, wouldn't boomers be more stressed out about the the pandemic considering no, the highest no, risk? No, I think most. I mean, Lisa, the the boomers I talk to, you know why? Because it's not their first rodeo. Exactly, it's not the first time the fucking country experience. was going to freak out. They've mm-hmm. been through missile crises. They've yeah. been through <laughs> they've been through other shit that was yeah. as scary or yeah. scarier. And they're like, oh, here. We, and and then a lot of so. It was interesting to me to see, uh, and it still is. This is happening right now. Um, yeah, they've had world wars. It really seems to me that uh, you know this division of left and right that we've seen more than we've ever seen. That the the younger generation is involved in it more than other. I would say in the past, if I was at a dinner or hearing someone in my family or friends yeah. debating politics, it's the old. It was the old dogs. Yeah, they were kind of debating over some you know economic philosophy or social issues yeah. that are going on. It was it was this kind of like older conversation. It's the opposite now. Yeah, I a, I, you, I see them being like, oh, who gives a fuck? Or it's yeah. just like, oh, old that news. Was Mark Norman's whole bit was like, oh, really? Yeah, the whole thing and like how you know we've won as adults because now. Now, like, you know, the younger generations are taking on all the problems and trying to solve the world shit, and, and the rest of us are playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> all the boomers are playing time. video games? Yeah, it's yeah. true. Like they're I mean, that's what I feel like, though. Don't you guys feel that yeah, way? Yeah, that's I feel because like- they're told to. Kids are told now that they need to care, and it's all over their media. They're so, so social media is used more by kids, and it's more and it's on social media, whereas before... The informa- the fear stuff was on the news. Yeah, everybody's kid- an activist now. You know? no, no kids watch the news. When I was a kid, you didn't watch the news. Like, who yeah. cares? Six, oh, news is on. I'm going to go play now. My, my cartoons are over or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, something else to consider. Ooh. Older people, when they're stressed, so this might play a role, sometimes lose weight. So I'm uh, so not to downplay you know what you might have said about boomers not necessarily stressing as much, but one thing that's interesting is when you're younger and you get stressed, you're more likely to gain weight, and when you're older and you're stressed, I think sometimes you see is that true? lose weight. Yeah, I, I've trained a lot of older uh, individuals. They picked up smoking instead. No, they just they just don't they just <laughs> don't eat the as boomers, much. The boomers are like ah fucking give me a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. Well, okay, I'm on my way out. <laughs> it's let me put it this way: yeah. if, if you're like, let's say you're in your late sixties, you're less likely to all of a sudden become obese. If your health declines, you tend to lose weight. Mm. Is what you tend to see more mm. often, I would say, than you know people in younger. Well, speaking to like you know the younger generation and kids and whatnot, like. Uh, there's a parent hack that I found that we actually we got this game because I think it was uh, my in-laws. Um, they had this and they said, here, try this out. This is works great. Uh, not my in-laws, my uh, brother-in-law, uh, his family uses this. But basically, it's called Table Topics. And, and so every time we have dinner now, like you just pull a card out of there. And it's it's really interesting because it asks you sort of a, I love it. a moral dilemma kind of question. Um, and you get to kind of go around and, and ask and see like what they would do in that situation. Brilliant. You get so much insight on the way that these kids think. And, you know, my kids specifically, like it was, it was interesting. Like you ask something like, um, you know, uh, I think one of them, let's see, I try and remember, um, one of them, one of them revolved around like, if you were at your friend's house, uh, would you rummage through and look through things at their house, you know, when they're not looking or, 
uh, you know, other ones about like a bank. If you knew that your best friend, you know, had, had stolen money from somewhere or whatever and didn't get caught, like, would you turn him in? Or, yeah. you know, it's all these like. Not like, if they gave me some. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it's like all these questions black for nuance, <laughs> you know, like. It, it, no, I, so I shared this as a, a relationship hack a long time ago. I don't know if you guys remember that. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe because you didn't know what that game was. or whatever. So we've had this for a long time. And uh, this was something that Katrina and I started doing. Like I talked about before how we would uh, listen to an audio book together. This game is another thing that we would do. We would like, we'd sit there in bed and we'd just pull one out. And it, it would just, it's it's uh, the way they pose the questions. It creates like this, this dialogue. It's not, it's not straightforward. Yes or no. I would do, right. you have to like, kind of like, it, it creates a scenario where you really get to see, dive into maybe your so partner. So doesn't cause an argument. Well, I mean, it could. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it could. absolutely, right it, it, it absolutely oh. could. But I also think that there. I mean, I think there. I wish I remember like some of the ones that Katrina and I that. Uh, I mean, we would we had been there, been together at that point uh, at least nine years or so. So knew each other, I would say, really well. But there would be things that we would start discussing. I'd be like, oh wow, I didn't really know that you believed that or mm -hmm. thought that way, and is because there are specific scenarios well, like that. Yeah, in terms of so the difference between even like my youngest and oldest, how they answer, because my youngest is so black and white like you know this is right this is wrong and most little kids are like no that. great which is great because i always want to hear his take first and then you hear like ethan's more nuanced kind of well uh i wonder if you know you really needed that money and like you know you needed something for you know helping somebody else or you know what yeah. the like he wants to know more context more details yeah. and that's and then i i would like add on top of that and like what about if, if you consider this like uh, so it was, it, it, at least it starts like a really good conversation that you can kind of go around. Yeah, little with. kids are like that. They tend to be more black and white. All right. I got a moral dilemma question for you. So I, you said moral dilemma. I, re I remembered a couple that I, we did in psychology class and we debated and it was fascinating. So here's one. Okay. Let's say you had a time machine and you could go back in time to when Hitler was a baby. Oh, I've heard And you could before. kill Would him. Would you kill him? Yeah. Would you do it? Yeah. And it was this great discussion. First of all, what, what no, you then you're a baby killer. The, the answer, an answer, the answer is, is yes, that everyone would typically say, but the truth is, no, they wouldn't. Because as a baby, you wouldn't know that he was going no, to No, even be. if you knew. If you go back and you know that's Hitler, right? You, you still got to kill a baby, though. And not only that, but he's innocent at that point. He's right. done nothing. That's he's what I'm just saying. A baby. So yeah. it's this dilemma, but then you'd save all these people and whatever. And then there's another one where there's well, a. you just kidnap him. Huh? And raise them right? <laughs> yeah. And chain them up? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, kidnap them. Like, yeah. Put them in a crate? Put them in a crate. <laughs> hey, 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 feed his, his yeah, art yeah, career? Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. I'm not going <laughs> to kill you. Yeah. Oh, you're such a good painter. Yeah, you got yeah. good art skills. And What's that? What is that movie? Oh, yeah, what, yeah. what is that? It was it, uh, there was a, a TV show uh, or movie or show. It was a series. I believe it was called... Uh, a, what, not frat, start with an F. Come on, Adam, I can get, get this. We talked to, it had the multiple universes. <laughs> and yourself. when you would go back, you would go back on, Adam, in time you and you would do something like that. And they would like, they would change something, but then it changed the trajectory. So let's say you kidnapped oh, yeah. him. But then he became even more torturous because he was he was angry, of, right? So you stopped, or whatever. yeah, you stopped one thing from happening, and then it, it just of course all these other things. Yeah, you have no that. idea if if you did that, and then you ended up raising him right, but it just made him a better dictator, and he ended up right, you know, right. He, he, now he had better right. skills, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So he ruled longer. Yeah, here's <laughs> another one. Here's yeah. another one. Right, a train is speeding down a track, and it's going to run over a person that you can't free. So they're on the track. No, it's going to run over. A uh, hundred people who are on the track, and you can't do anything about it except pull a lever and switch it to another track that only kills one person. Do you pull the lever? So that's another dilemma, right? What do you do? But, but oh, you're well, sitting there. So you're saving one to a hundred people. Yeah. So if that's you pull kind of it, easier one. Don't kill, you think? It'll, if you pull it, it'll switch. No matter what, you're kill killing. You're killing people. Well, you're going to kill well, either hundred or one. Kill them though, right? Huh? Why wouldn't you let No, the dilemma him? would be if the one person was somebody you knew. Well, that would put it a whole new dilemma. Because that's an easy answer. Oh, I don't care. That's a hundred for me. A hundred, what? That's not like, well, yeah. I'll kill a random, hundred random people over well, one person that's I know. My, that's I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the truth. I'm, I'm being honest here. If it's like my family. It, that hadn't been that way. A, it, it would it, be sad. Because if it's a hundred strangers and one stranger, that, that's the that's an odd. There's no dilemma there. No, the Who dilemma is the dilemma's still this. If you pull the lever, you're a murderer. If yeah. you don't, you didn't do anything. That's my point is like if, oh. if, if they're going to get murdered, like let let that be on whatever the yeah. scenario is. I don't want to be a part of it. Yeah. So that's, oh, but that's that's such a tough like. So I would I think that's so for me, that one's an easy one because I mm. think it's like at that point, regardless of <laughs> Adam's like, sorry, murder. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm either, I'm either allowing a hundred people to get murdered, or I'm making sure only one person You're dies. Like, I'm a quick. numbers guy, you guys. <laughs> yeah, that's, okay. why, that's, that's why it's easy math for me. Where it becomes a dilemma is if, like, my family or friend, someone, oh, I, easy. someone yeah. I know is on. Oh, that's an easy like that. one. If it's yeah. somebody I care about, and it's a hundred random people, and this will be sad. I'd still be very upset about this. But most people, <laughs> hey, hey, you're lying if you're not if you yeah. if you say you wouldn't. No, you're this. right. Of you're, course you would. You're right, but yeah. it does make you kind of think for a minute. They're like, ah, oh, damn, dude. I know, like, totally. All right, you know, it think- depends on what friend. Like one friend's worth like fifty, but not quite a hundred. Yeah. I have a hierarchy. <laughs> That's sure. it. I mean, it's I put a point system yeah, next yeah. to. The, so anyway, uh, stuff you got to think about. So I want to ask your opinion about this, Justin, because I know you're all about meat in your box. Have you <laughs> seen the new offer? Whoa, whoa there. Huh? Whoa there no, you, you like, the, like butcher box. I'm talking about butcher box right now. Have Great you seen commercial their, transition. I love that meat in the box. Yeah. Have you seen their their offer? Is, what, what's going on right now, Doug? There's this like New Year's bundle. <laughs> it's a variety meat box, I think. Yeah. yeah Lots they're, of they're seven adding, pounds of meat right in your box. They put that meat in a box. Is that really what it says on the uh, on their ad? Right here. It but, says... Uh, that's more than seven pounds of meat added to your first box for free. Oh, Holy say, wow. say meat in your box. So listen what they're doing. No, away. no. <laughs> oh, that would be a better ad in the box. So you know what's okay. If Mind Pump was doing your ads, that's what it would look like. Yeah. <laughs> We'd have Justin singing. Take seven pounds of meat in your box. <laughs> How do we fit seven pounds of meat in your box? <laughs> and we'll throw in some free pig. Yeah, sign up and find oh, out. I love this. No, commercial. check this out. Uh, this is what they're giving you ground beef, chicken thighs, and pork butt. So for free, seven. I don't know. How are they doing this with inflation? Yeah. Have you seen the inflation numbers? How is ButcherBox doing this with their I boxes? I don't know, but God bless I them. would imagine that they already have uh, deals made with like private farmers because that it's coming from mostly private farmers, right? A bunch yeah. of uh, yeah, local, I mean, and they're and they're you know they're looking for quality, right? Grass fed, grass. So a lot of that stuff isn't is isn't regulated by other stuff that's getting all kinds of subsidies and stuff, right? So you have they're it's they're less impacted and influenced. I by would that. Be, I would believe I, I know would they're think, impacted. I don't know. I would believe they're impacted. They're always, but impacted. less so because there's less middlemen. Right, right, because you're not going three or four steps down, but I mean seven pounds for free in your first, that's a lot. No, yeah. it's a that's hell of a that's. Oh, well, you always got options. I, that's the biggest thing. Is I love coming home. It's like if in doubt, there's some meat in the in the freezer that you can make something out of it. You yeah. know, like and it it helps. Oh, I bought a. I have a freezer in the garage. I have not, not just a deep freezer, which they're inexpensive. By the way. I don't know, yeah, it's like hundred bucks. It's like build the bucks. meal off the meat, then you build everything. Yeah, and I it. and I'll I'll get like lot like if it's on sale or whatever, or butcher box has a deal, I'll fill it up, and it's all there, ready to go. And you just pull it out, defrost it for the next day, and cook it, and you got healthy food yeah, whenever that's... you want. You save a lot of money, and money that's true. We were talking about this earlier. You guys look at your bill oh, when you eat out. Oh. Food prices have gone through the roof, bro. It's crazy. Yeah, it's been yeah, it's one of those things that you don't really pay attention a lot of times to the receipt and then I just started looking at it and was like, "Oh my god, like hundreds of dollars, you Dude, know." I have I got 3 kids. When we go out to eat, if we go out to a semi whatever restaurant, I'm not even talking about like, you know, super nice, just like a a normal regular restaurant you take your family to, it's 200 bucks at least mm-hmm. for all of us. Yeah. I'm going to spend 200 bucks on the bill just to eat, you know, some food or whatever. It's kind of crazy. You you see the uh you know speaking of in, the inflation and how it's impacting all these different uh, all these different markets and industries is uh you, the cars man the cars are crazy I don't think we're gonna get our car till next Dude, year bro. Don't say that. It's, I know it's I'm almost 100 percent sure. I mean they, I think they sl- sold us on oh yeah we're thinking six to six months maybe nine tops like I'm thinking a year and a half. That's why car lucky. salesmen get a bad rap sometimes. Yeah. I think. Those yeah, guys. just to get the like, deal done. Oh, come on. Like, it, it, and it's like American, so it's not like it's coming from off sea. It has everything to do with the computer chip. Because basically all, all cars all your- cars today are are just you know computer on wheels now. That's really what most well, all cars sucks, are. that sucks because my brother-in-law works in that part of the uh, you know the chip industry and was like, he, he keeps pushing out even like two, three-year dates to uh, people that are ordering still. And I'm like, no, because- yeah, who knows? Who knows when they're going to sort all this out? So new car prices, I think, are up something like nine or ten percent. Did you see used car prices? Crazy, thirty-seven percent. Bro, I'm so tempted to sell one of mine because the only problem is I don't won't get yeah, able to want, replace it. Exactly. So you're that's why it's so. Tempting, if you have a used car, you're not going to use. You are going to thirty-seven percent is the average rise in used car. My brother so bought a car, okay, sold it two years later with a lot of more miles on it and made more money. 
Mm-hmm. Sold it for more than he bought it for. Well, I mean, I, I'm in, I'm in a really cool yeah. situation right now because three years ago, uh, so March will be my my third year. I'm up on my lease. So three years ago, I leased that Mercedes. Mm-hmm. So and I'm buying it outright. Oh, but you're gonna get a good deal now because you it know, was it's locked set. in. Yeah, it's locked in. So my you they when you do a lease, they have the buyout the day I could buy yeah. that out. I could have bought it out anytime I want. Right. So uh, and all they do is they add the the months that you would normally pay the lease to the left, right? Yeah. So if I were to buy it out right now, I'd have to pay uh, January and February's payment plus the buyout price. Yeah. But the buyout price is so low for that car, I could probably sell it for 10, 15 grand more. So you make money on it. Yeah. I wonder if the dealerships, knowing this, are going to offer some They do. Kind. They offered me. What do they do? So they so I have a lot of different options right now because I already called in to see like what I what I could do. Um and they will. They'll they'll buy it back from me. I could base or I could keep it and keep leasing it for the same price. So that's an option. Or they'll they'll uh, allow me to trade it in and get a new one. The problem is if I want to get a new one, I'll be subject to the new rates and all the rates are up mm-hmm. on everything. So, so well, what's the deal though? If you could have got a new one anyway, if nothing changed, is it is there like a better deal or something? Well, then buying it out is a better deal. Okay. Yeah, they normally wouldn't pay that much for it. Got you it. basically would tr- trade it in for nothing. Where they would they would pay me a little bit premium, but I'd be way better off buying it myself and then selling it on the on the market because they are that's they'll pay, they'll give me a premium because there's such a high premium already, and then they'll go ahead and turn around and sell it for an even bigger premium because of the way the market is right now. So. But I'm far better off doing it myself, and that's what what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, I'm buying it outright, and then I'm going to just shop and just like let's see, let's see what I because I don't necessarily need it, and if I have to drive one of the other vehicles Whatever. for worst case scenario, you sell it, make some money. Well, that's you what I'm still saying. Own yeah. uh, stock in CarMax. I do. Yeah. How's yeah. that doing? It does. It's it's one of my better ones. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say yeah. the used car market must be. Yeah. Uh, I haven't looked at that. So I, that's an, another. So that's my Charles Schwab account. I don't go. To, I don't look at that one as much as I do my E Trade account. I'm look them up right now. But uh, yeah, I bought it along. I bought. So you know what made me buy that stock? Uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina. Mm. So well, I, Carmax just went recently went down. Actually, well, everything's going down, right? Yeah, everything yeah, is down right down. now. It's yeah. but I bought it like in the forties, dude. Did you really? Yeah, it's yeah. at one nineteen. Yeah, yeah, I bought it. So I bought it right, right, uh, right when Hurricane Katrina hit. And I I can't remember what I was reading or what I was watching. They they were saying about how many people lost their cars in there. And at that time, CarMax was the number one oh. used car dealership in there. And most insurance claims would give you enough money for your cars to go right out and do that. And because they had such a large fleet and in that area, it was kind of like a no brainer uh, buy. Interesting. Yeah. Uh-huh. It, it Speaking of well. weird car markets, you ever wonder why pictures of Cuba always have like 1950s American cars in them? You ever, you ever wonder why? Mm. Oh, yeah, I remember hearing about this. Like, there's all kinds of like, uh, especially the years of the 50, the tri Chevy years. Yeah. Like, they have tons of those cars. Because what? Of, what? Okay, so if you go to Cuba right now, okay. so I don't know about right now, but it was a communist country for a long time <clears throat> and embargo, like, no, we're not trading with you. We're shutting you off. So they got American cars up to a certain point and then that was it. Nobody was trading with them anymore. So what people did is they had all these old American cars and they just kept remaking them, making them look nice, taking care of them. So if you go there now, you'll see these old, some people own these, these old, old American vehicles. cars yeah. because they, they can't buy any new ones. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So oh, if you've ever wondered that, that's that's one of the reasons. I didn't even know that. That's uh-huh. actually a really interesting fact because they could probably sell it back to America for a decent price if, if they they're classic. they can't sell anything. Yeah, they can't. That's I know. I've tried to look into that because somebody told me about that. There's yeah, see? like Oh, so that's so streets. many. Oh of my them god! There. And that's like current. These are current pictures. Like yeah. In, so I, I don't, oh my god! That's I know so trade, it's like the fifties. I don't know like if it. trade is is more open now than it was, but for a long time it was like shut off. Like you, it was even illegal to get Cuban cigars. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because no, we weren't allowed. It's still like that. Yeah. Do you? But, did you? You know, speaking of cars, <clears throat> you guys, we brought up on this podcast maybe three, four years ago. Uh, this market or this this I think we actually even talked about this company. Uh, Turo, T U R O. I think that's how I, I think I wrote it over or sent it over to you, Doug. The right. Sounds familiar. What is it? So they're basically uh, the Airbnb of oh, right. cars. So and they so been, you could rent you could oh. rent a car from someone else. A private. They're about to go public, case. right? So they've been okay. growing year over year, even with the pandemic. Oh, that's and a buy. I like it. I like it a lot. I just you know I do. We just talked about this recently too that we're moving to this era of. Nobody owning anything and just you know leasing or borrowing or or loaning or renting uh, is just going to be the way of the future. So for I a have lot of friends things. in uh, San Francisco that I don't know if they work with Turo, but they do this where they don't own cars, but we have family in San Jose, 
and they don't go through your typical, you know, enterprise or whatever. They go through these apps and they'll drive, they'll, they'll ride their bike or whatever to someone's house. The, you get the keys and take the car and, and, and drive it. And yeah. I, I really want to, um, I really want to try it out and, and just experience it for myself. So I wonder if it's going to be a little bit like, do you guys remember, like I, I've been using Airbnb and VRBO since basically it started. And uh, I remember when we first started this podcast, it just, you know, eight years ago, how different uh, it is today than then. Like it looks way more like the hotel industry today oh. than what it did then. Yeah, before when you was, first used to do it, yeah. you show up to someone's house, you know, they get their picture frames know. up and like, you know, bed sheets that are probably four years old. Yeah. And like, you know what I'm saying? Like it just felt like you were renting Grandma's definitely. Doily right next yeah, to yeah. You were, you, you could yeah. tell and you felt like you were renting somebody's house mm -hmm. um, or that you were. So I wonder if that's even how this is looking right now where you get in and it has like somebody else's kind of smell to it and they're yeah. maybe there's their, so, their drink that they had yesterday. So I was talking about <laughs> Gatorade like bottle. Yeah. So yeah. I was yeah. talking to my cousin about this because again, he lives in the city and he does this yeah. and he showed me the math. He said, you could buy a car. He, I don't remember what company he showed. It was Hyundai or something. They had a deal. I was like, a, like $99 for you know a lease or car payment, some whatever. And he goes, you could buy that car. This is your lease payment and you could rent it out for this many days of the month and you'll make a profit. And he goes, there's people doing this right now. They're buying cars or leasing them or whatever. Specifically for rent. So, and yes, we'll, and they rent it to and, other and people. This, and that is how... And see, that's the way to do it. Well, I mean, that is that is the natural evolution of Airbnb. Yeah. I mean, Airbnb first were people that had second homes that they just weren't using. And they thought, oh, wow, I have this second home. I'm not using it. We can rent well, it out. Isn't, we can that, money. Isn't, isn't that where all the investors were interested in single home families? Well, yeah, that's right, a, a part of part why of that is going that direction. And, where that, and that's my point is... I, I'm sure there's people that have already figured the math out that it makes a decent business model totally. and it's only going to grow and keep going. I would I would bet though there's a good percentage that probably look like you're borrowing somebody's car right now that yeah. did, but uh, but sooner than later I bet you're going to see it like Airbnb where that the norm becomes it's just like you're renting a car from yeah you, you have know. a person and they own a fleet of you know ten cars or eight cars and yeah. they have a, maybe a lot or they have you know, a, a garage and a driveway or something where you go pick up your car and they make a little bit of money. My question is insurance. How does car insurance work with that? Because it's okay for me to let a friend borrow my car, but would my insurance- So I imagine that's part of why you go through a third party like Turo. That they provide- uh, Yeah, so of, Turo has, like I believe, like, I think I read this. I, I believe they have some sort of like a million dollar policy or what, I don't remember. I'm just I'm spouting numbers. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I know it is like they have a policy that covers- their drivers. So you, as the owner of the car, uh, you have your basic insurance for when you mm -hmm. you crash it with that. But if if someone who is using Turo is using your car, I think they could. Which is why you would give up your. Otherwise, it'd be better for me just to go to Justin and go like, "Hey, bro, you want to borrow my car? It's seventy five yeah, bucks." Yeah, you're a day. right. You're right. Mm -hmm. They have their own. So here's the other thing. How much is it? Oh, it's not a million. It's seven ninety or something uh, like that. Seven fifty. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, you know, who's gonna? You're not gonna lease out a car or rent out a car that's more than seven. Yeah. Here's my Bugatti. A Bugatti. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, my my cousin said that a lot of people who don't have credit or who have had bad credit go through these private because a lot of people don't realize it's it's hard to rent a car from the big car rental companies if your credit isn't amazing mm -hmm. or whatever, right? So he says that a lot of people go through these private peer to peer. You know, companies in order to use. Well, and also too, I remember like when we were in Hawaii. Remember how hard it was to rent a car? Yes, like they had sold like half their stock. Yep. Uh, and so then they're still trying to reacquire vehicles again now. Okay, so you know what would probably? I'm going to guess here. I wonder if trucks. I wonder if owning a truck would be very profitable on something like that because a lot of people don't want to necessarily own a trunk, a truck, but then they may need one. Yeah. What a great way to be like, I need, I'm moving Home this Depot weekend. Home Depot was one of the first to jump on that. Yeah. I mean, I, w I would say yes, but also, I mean- Like just a pickup. U-Haul's done a pretty good job of, of you can rent just a pickup for 19 bucks. Mm -hmm. So good luck trying to find this thing to be that much. Maybe maybe you could. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I mean I got, but I, I mean, U-Haul has done a pretty good job to, to for someone who's just looking for a yeah. truck for work- Right, a work uh, truck. I just, where, where I see this is just the, the future of like kids will go. Why should I don't need to own a car? I half the time I walk, the other time I bike. I sometimes use the electric scooter, and then every once in a while I want to go on a nice date. So with that, so what is that? Four times a month, 
I want a nice vehicle to go to dinner or I want to go now, somewhere how that is I'll, I'll just rent it. How is a company like this going to survive when uh, self-driving cars become the norm and everybody's kind of renting those? I, mean, I wonder if they'll transition. I mean, the truth is that's so far ahead still. We, yeah. we act like that's close, but that, that transition is so far away still. Yeah, I'm sure that they're probably already looking at it and going, all right, here's how we'll pivot when that happens. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and again, you, I mean, they could potentially have a viable, profitable, incredible business for the next decade and that not even affecting it until then. That's true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and they've already been running. They're already in the million. I think they saw like, they. I want to say they did like 70 million or something like that. Wow, or, or, really? Or, yeah, no, they're wow, making- Wow, that's they're, great. And I think they were boasting that they had 100 and- 100. Well, can we, can we keep an eye on when it's going to IPO? Because I, I, I'd be very interested in that, mm -hmm. in that company. Uh, speaking of uh, good quality companies, I finally ripped a pair of my Viore pants. Finally, the rip stop. The ones that say rip so stop. You finally on. ripped the rip stops. The butt. Well, welcome to the club. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I'm saying this because I know you've done this like five times. I did. Like, yeah. yeah, at least a few. And what was cool is they sent me a new pair and everything, but it was like, I don't know what it was about the rip stops, but I had to actually move on to the metas. Those are like my new jam. Yeah, they're, it's the cakes area. That's, that's the problem. Yeah, but I ripped mine working out, and so I think it might maybe my butt's growing, Justin. Oh, yeah, definitely I, wasn't from you doing the I mean, athletic, right? So no, I wasn't been hitting those squats yeah. like crazy. I, was, I so. wasn't jumping or doing anything, <laughs> anything <laughs> dynamic. That's for sure. <laughs> but, but this morning I go to put them on. I look at the no. back. I'm like, oh, I was kind of proud. Yeah, now, are those, so what pairs do you have? Do you have ripstop? Do you I have, like ripstop. I like the Sunday joggers. Those uh, are the two that you. Those have. are my favorites. Oh. Yeah, the, the Sunday ones are super comfortable. But the ripstop, they're not. I like the way that they feel. I like to work out legs in them because they feel a little bit more yeah. supportive. That's so. weird to me because I, I like think the they're chinos so too. I think I think that's what they're called, but they're like uh, more loose fit. Uh, yeah, is that the chinos right there? No, is a different these brand? are like these almost. These are Viore, but they're they're almost more like um, I hate to say well, doctors, like but like yeah, yeah, like a slack, is yeah, more like, like a little dressier. Slacks. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of athletics, uh, got a new study on how exercise benefits the brain, which is pretty cool. Another nail in the coffin on the dumb uh, in the dumb jock, you know, <laughs> narrative, right? So check this out. I know, right? Remember the that back in the day? Heads, yep. Exercise alters brain chemistry to protect aging synapses. So when elderly people stay active. Their brains have more of a class of proteins that enhances the connections between neurons to maintain healthy cognition, a new study has found. So this was at the University of California in uh, San Francisco. Now, obviously, it makes sense. The brain is an organ. So if you're healthy and fit, then like your heart and your liver and your kidneys, your brain is going to stay healthy. Um, but it's interesting because not that long ago, people thought keeping your, your brain healthy meant doing cognitive exercises, mm -hmm. but physical activity... Physical activity is one of the best things you could do for your brain. Well, I mean, Keep te it sharp. technically it's cognitive too. I mean, when you're doing- yeah, Anything you do is your brain, right? Yeah, especially, and I think that's another another added value to those uh, the complex barbell movements that we talk about totally. all the time. I mean, I can be drifting away and thinking about other things uh, than my arms when I'm doing tricep pushdowns. But if I'm sitting, getting ready to do squats and I got yeah. 225 plus on my back, mm -hmm. I ain't thinking about nothing you're, else. You're still problem solving. Yeah. You just know, it, yeah, physically it. problem solving. And that's the thing is all of this is feedback that you're providing to your brain, neural feedback. It's yeah. actually in crazy how much, I mean, the, I've seen who did we talk about on this podcast about uh, the math that's computed to throw a ball. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah like it, it's it crazy. It's almost the, on a predictive level. Yeah, that your that what your brain is doing in order to do yeah. that. So, but yeah. the, but the belief was like, oh, if I do like word puzzles and if I memorize poems and read, that that's going to keep my brain healthy. Well, if you're gangster, you do a word puzzle while you squat. While you squat, mm -hmm. that's what I do. No, it's <laughs> yeah. the physical activity and muscle is very protective of the brain because muscle is great for insulin sensitivity and. Losing your ability to really utilize insulin properly can lead to things like dementia. And now, is the reason for that because the muscle puts more demand on glucose? Is that why? So it's it, it's, it's, it's it's prioritized it's, there it's, instead of yeah. It's one way your body will store glycogen, but also muscle is very insulin sensitive. So like they'll have studies on obese individuals, and they won't lose any weight. They'll just have them gain a little muscle, and you see this incre this great effect on insulin, even though they haven't lost any weight, just because they've gained a little bit of muscle. So. Building muscle, especially as you age, just makes a big difference. But it's good information to know because, again, it wasn't that long ago where that wasn't the message. The message was, oh, it's good for your heart. It's good for everything else. But the brain, you know, it doesn't really have an effect. Not true. It's got a profound it's positive interconnected. effect on the brain, definitely. Hey, look, do you have digestive issues because you eat a high-protein diet? You're trying to bulk. You find yourself bloated, uh, having gas, uh, heartburn. 
Well, sometimes digestive enzymes can make all the difference in the world, but not just any digestive enzymes. You want to go with a company that focuses on athletes or people who are focused on performance, muscle building, and fat loss. That's why we work with a company called Masszymes. They make the best digestive enzymes we've found anywhere. So go check them out. Head over to masszymes.com forward slash mind pump. Masszymes is M A S S Z Y M E S dot com again forward slash mind pump. And then use the code mind pump 10 for 10% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Grayson from Oklahoma. Grayson, what's happening? Uh, I am a currently a junior in college. Um, I'm a biology pre med student. I've pretty much just grown up with, you know, wanting to be a doctor and everything like that. But um, as I've gotten older, especially, I've really just like my passion is in health and fitness. You know, that's what I'm really interested in. And so I want to do something, you know, that's health and wellness related. Um, and I, I, I haven't seen a ton of doctors that have really created a practice that is, you know, kind of interconnects the fitness and the medicine industry. And so I really just wanted to come to talk to you guys, since I know you guys have such an extensive knowledge of the fitness industry as a whole and see, you know, if you guys know, or have been around, uh, physicians, um, or anyone in the medical field that's kind of, you know, intertwined the medical and the fitness industry. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, uh, thank you by the way, for your interest. I think this is a great combination when you have the expertise of Western medicine, combine it with, you know, fitness training and nutrition type coaching. Now here's the, the challenge with what you're asking. And I know you're asking, do I know anybody like that? You know, off the top of my, my head, not necessarily, but here's the challenge. And I'm sure you know this better than anybody. When you're trying to become a specialist in Western medicine, like you don't have time to also simultaneously become a specialist uh, and gain the experience that's required to be really good at training and coaching people. It's really hard to do all by yourself. So what I would do in your shoes is this, and I've thought about this a lot in the past. In fact, this was actually something I even thought about doing at one point, which is when you figure out what your specialty is, do that, and then you can get your own office. And then within that office, I would have a space for correctional exercise with trainers and with people who can coach nutrition. And when people come in, they'll see you as the specialist, but then they can work through coaching with nutrition and they can work with exercise specialists within your facility. I think that would be so valuable. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that that's the future of a lot of medicine. I think it's it's gonna be a combination of those things. Oh yeah, I worked at a, well I didn't work, I did like an internship uh, when I was in college at this place in Condell Medical Center. Uh, right across the street from there was this amazing gym that had uh, physicians on hand, it had personal trainers, physical therapists, uh, you know, you name it, everything was sort of in-house and uh, it was great because they all communicated with each other and were able to, you know, blend um, the the programming and everything to fit and tailor that specific client uh, amazingly. So I think that there's, I would love to see more of that kind of synergy amongst everybody's professions uh, working together like that. Well, I think that's the, I think that's the answer is you're more likely to partner up with somebody who's like the the if you're gonna you go the doctor route and then you partner up with the fitness expert or you go the the fitness route like uh -huh. yeah and then you find a doctor that aligns with your values and you partner with the doctor um and i think not to say that you can't do both i just think that if you go through all the work and effort to become a a, a doctor uh, the the money side of the fitness side is not going to be very appealing. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like uh, I can see patients uh, and practice Western medicine, and I get paid this much. Uh, if I spend any time over here on this kind of training clients, personal trainer side, I'm not making shit compared to that. So that, I think that would be the the challenge that you would probably uh, run into if you were trying to kind of live in both worlds. You know, the only person that comes to mind, uh, uh, Stephen Cabral kind of like this yeah I mean, he's a uh, functional medicine right? yeah he's got yeah. both he's got yeah. he's got western and eastern medicine yeah. that's what makes him kind of mm -hmm. unique which uh, I, but still primarily a doctor not really personal training or recommending i mean he does a lot of stuff in nutrition yeah um but not really recommending that i mean that that would be my recommendation is to is to work on being a specialist uh, specifically in one of those areas and then trying to align yourself with another specialist in the opposite. And, 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 and because you have a passion for both, 
you'll have probably a good idea of what a, a good trainer looks like, right? You would look, you you would align your values well with that versus your your traditional doctor oh, that yeah. maybe doesn't care and, as much. Well, or yeah, and, a, and if you stay the medical side, you could get sports medicine experts, and you can get physical therapists who also have some specialization in uh, other forms of exercise because physical therapists are the best for correctional exercise, but then you want to also understand progressive overload and that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of PTs that also know that as well. So it's a, it's a medical facility, even covered by insurance that kind of incorporates all of these things. I really do see this being the future yeah. of medicine in a lot of different ways. So you're, you're, you're headed in the right direction uh, completely, Grayson. Well, thank you guys. I, I, I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, the other thing that, you know, I was, you know, kind of interested and I've kind of been looking at is the physical therapy route. Uh, just because I know you guys mentioned um, the other day that, you know, part of kind of the disconnect between an MD and, a, you know, the patients and everything when they're trying to give health and wellness advice and stuff like that is they're not with them every day. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe, you know, I'm, you know, if I went the physical therapy route, I could get that, you know, maybe three day a week connection with a, with a patient um, where you could have maybe more of an impact. And so that's kind of just what I'm trying to decide at this point. Cause I, I do, I, you know, I love that part of, um, you know, the, and like, I just love the fitness industry so much. And I'm like, man, if I want to do what I love, maybe that's more yeah. of a route. Yeah. So just kind of figuring it out. You know, at, at, at 20 years old, you're, it's a great, great age to be at, to be asking these types of questions. And, and probably uh, some of the best advice could be too, is just to uh, go, go dabble in a little bit of all of it and see what you find yourself most passionate about. What, what is it that you stay up at night reading and, and learning about when you're not getting paid and you don't have to study for a test, mm -hmm. but just because you're interested in it and let that drive uh, your decision on where, what direction maybe you, you should go as far as a career, you know, and, 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 play with everything. I mean, I feel, I feel like at this age, it's a good time to, to try all these ideas that you have out and just see which one you naturally kind of fall into based off of what you're spending time doing when you're not being told to or yeah. getting paid to. There, there's a lot of directions you can go. I mean, you can even go the direction of orthopedic surgeon and then in your facility work with physical therapists and trainers and people who work nutrition. I mean, there's so many ways to complement Mm -hmm. all these different fields. Um, and if you're the medical mm -hmm. expert, it's your, it's your facility. I mean, I, I, I tried doing this with, uh, with doctor clients of mine, not necessarily creating a business together, but I created a network of people I'd refer to. So if I had somebody who had, you know, uh, gastro issues, I had a, a, a gastro specialist I would send people to, I had a two couple general surgeons that I could refer to if there were some issues. And I had some therapists that I would refer to. So I could, I could see there's so much potential here. Um, but I think Adam's uh, hitting the nail on the head, like do the, for you specifically, do the one that you feel most passionate about. Cause you'll be the best at that. Um, and then you can supplement and complement with that, with other people helping you in that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Excellent. for sure. All right. Perfect. Thanks for calling. Hey, well, thank you guys for having me on. You guys are awesome. No you guys problem. Are big time. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. My best success hands down period with clients was when people worked with me and they worked with you know one or two other specialists that were experts at things that I was not. Um, I had people work with me, and then massage therapists and physical therapists, or with me and you know people who were experts in nutrition or with hormones. And it was wonderful because what I would do is I would uh, create these these uh, these email threads where we would all work together. Yeah. And sometimes they would say to me, "Hey Sal, I don't think you should be doing." squats with this person because I'm noticing an issue here with the knee or whatever. And then I would say, well, what about this particular issue with mobility? And say, well, you know, that's a good idea. And we would go back and forth and construct like the best uh, yeah. combination of, of therapies. And the success rate was tremendous. Well, it, just, it just seems that that's the most likely scenario, right? Is to, to, to get together with other specialists and then create some sort of versus what I got he was asking at the beginning, which is more like what he could do all of it. I just don't see... 
I don't see you being, I don't know any. any yeah, some hybrid of that. Yeah, just, like, I don't know any doctors that went through all the schooling to become a doctor and then thought, oh, I'm going to also. I'm going to go do 10 years I, of personal training. Yeah, I'm going to go do personal training. And I, I mean, what's your what's your guys' guess on why that is? I mean, mine is just the money, right? It's, it's just the like, money and the time. Yeah, dude. you put all that time and effort into getting your PhD and the at least you're make, making a pretty good income you if go you to, did that. You, you go to school. First of all, you have to crush in college. Then you go to medical school. You got to crush right. there. Then you got to do an internship. You got to crush there. And the whole time it's bell to bell, yeah. uh, very stressful, very challenging. Then you get to start to practice medicine and you 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 now need to build experience as a doctor. You're going to go and, and become experienced as a trainer for another five to 10 years. Like, I guess that by the time you're 50, you might be ready, you know, but that's a, that's a lot. You know, I think, and I also don't think you'll be as good as you being the expert on one thing That's right. mm -hmm. and then working with having other people work with you. The neat part though is if he has a passion for both, he'll have a good eye for who to- 100%. To, just, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So he'll have a good eye for what to look for in the trainer or the PTs or the other, the other practices, right? To align himself with. Our next caller is Alexandra from New York. Alexandra, how can we help you? Hey guys. Um, so I'm calling in because I was listening to a recent episode where you guys were advertising masszymes. Um, and I, I have to admit, I don't know much about these digestive enzymes, um, but the way it was described in the episode really spoke to me in that um, it sounded like, you know, if you have uh, problems digesting protein or things like that, it can really help. Um, and so, so candidly, that's an issue that I've kind of always had. Um, and I, I don't think it's like a particularly big deal for me personally, but there are times when I would like to eat more protein to put on more muscle mass, but I struggle because I can easily get, you know, constipated. Um, so I just try not to eat too much protein. Anyways, when I heard about mass signs, I thought that maybe this is something I should try. Um, but you know, I have a couple of concerns because from what I've heard from other people, not about mass enzymes specifically, but just about digestive enzymes in general, which is one, when you take them, they can kind of make you go to the bathroom a lot more, um, you know, like shit more. Mm -hmm. Um, and so one is, is that, done that before. Do you think that's true? And then, um, and then a follow up to that is, if you do start taking them, um, do you think you would kind of start relying on them to go to the bathroom more? Um, I wouldn't want to get like hooked on them. Yeah. So yeah, th that's my two part question. Yeah, good question. Okay, so uh, digestive enzymes can definitely help with digestive issues if the issue is you need more digestive enzymes for your diet. So if the issue is that you have I don't know, small intestinal um, bacterial overgrowth, or you're eating a food that you're intolerant to, or you're lacking fiber, or here's a big one, you're not drinking enough water, then it might not help that much. So if it is indeed a, that you need more digestive enzymes, I would say they're inexpensive. Try it out and see if it helps. But if it's not that, it could be something else. It could be what you're eating. It could be lack of fiber. It could be lack of water. Um, it could be stress. It could be a lot of different issues that can be causing digestive issues. Now, as far as becoming reliant on them, no, you're not going to become reliant. There's no negative feedback loop that I'm aware of with digestive enzymes where if you consume them, your body you know, produces less of them. So probably what happened with your friend, my guess is that she, it, she used them, they helped, and she continued to eat foods that would normally cause her problems. So then when she stopped taking the enzymes, then she gets those problems back. So the answer for her might have been to change the foods that she was eating in the first place. I hope that makes some, some well, sense. Well, I didn't I didn't mess with this at all until you actually cuz you're you're notorious for carrying around all your little your little vitamin purse that you have mm -hmm. and every time we would eat something off the It's a, it's a purse. Yeah, it's we, for men. you would eat these uh, digestive enzymes and I thought, you know what? We were I think one night we were at the Tahoe place we were getting ready to eat either pizza or something that had a lot of gluten and I I asked you guys cuz Justin does too. I see him uh, use it and I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't uh, like when I eat pizza, it doesn't destroy me, but it definitely, if I have more than like four slices, it could, it could ruin my night for sure. It ruins right. A lot of our nights when you do that. So, um, I, I, I asked to try it and I noticed a significant difference in how I responded yeah. to the pizza. So I've, so now I try and if I ever, I'm going to eat like ice cream or gluten, two things that I know that I have intolerance to, um, by doing that, it doesn't, I know it doesn't fix the problem. I know it doesn't, but it does mitigate. I feel yeah. the, the effects that I would, I would feel from that. Is that, is that correct? And should that, should that be happening that way? Is that right? Yeah, no, it is. And, and, and it's like, um, 
I don't know, this is not really a good example, but it's like taking an anti-inflammatory right after you use something that's inflammatory. So it can help, but the ultimate issue is that you eat you know, gluten and ice cream, right? Mm-hmm. That bother you. The way that I use digestive enzymes is I use them when I eat very high protein meals, especially if I'm not eating a lot of vegetables with that. It can make a difference for me. I also use, uh, I'll substitute fiber, so I'll take psyllium husk. That can help. Now, that's what works well for me. For some people, that might not necessarily help. The good thing about digestive enzymes are they're inexpensive, and you can try them out and see if they help. But ultimately, just like any supplement, it's not the ultimate cure, right? The, the ultimate cure is let's figure out at the root of what's going on and then use those in order to mitigate issues when maybe you go off or you eat in a way that might normally bother well, you. What would you classify like the HCL pills? Like, and so I, I usually do that to kind of cut back at some of the overgrowth. So that's hy- hydro, uh, let's see, HCL is, is hydrochloric acid? Am hydrochloric I right? acid, so, yeah. So it stokes basically you know, acid production in your stomach. It is. It is the acid that you produce. Um, but that's not a digestive enzyme. But see, that's another one, right? Yeah. So if you have low HCL, it can create an environment where bacteria actually builds up in your small intestines and then you start to develop issues. Um, and believe it or not, heartburn is a common side effect of not producing enough uh, yeah, which you know, is what I acid, which yeah. a lot of people think it's the opposite. They think they're making too much acid. Oftentimes, it's you're not making enough acid. So digestive issues tend to be complicated, but digestive enzymes are a very safe, easy, inexpensive thing that you can experiment with. And, and the reason why we work with bio-optimizers, mass enzymes, is because they design them specifically for athletes. So the the enzymes that are good for breaking down the types of foods that we tend to eat a lot of, especially protein, you tend to see more of them in there. And I've messed with a lot of digestive enzymes, and there's a lot of them that are good out there, but they're one of the better ones, and that's why we chose uh, working with them. But no, you won't become de- you, you won't become def- dependent. But if you don't solve the root issue, um, then you may need to use them always whenever you eat foods that tend to cause uh, problems. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it sounds to me a little bit um, like there's some trial and error here. I mean, you mentioned a few of the different root causes. Um, You know, I think, for example, water, that's one that I I feel like I do drink a a lot of water. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it could be the the um, the bacterial growth that you're talking about. And, you know, so maybe it's trying the enzymes. If that doesn't help, then maybe exploring other things or, you know, maybe it's cutting out foods. Maybe there are certain foods that I don't digest well that I, I just don't know about. Um, yeah. So it's probably a little bit of a, a process to get there. Yeah, But it, it sounds like it doesn't hurt to at least try the enzymes. Totally. And Alexandra, the a, a gut health specialist is worth their weight in gold. Yes. Okay. Because let's say you do have SIBO, right? Um, you can fix it. You can actually cure it. You might be have, you might've lived with it for, you know, five years. It's something that's curable, right? Um, digestive experts or gut health experts are so valuable because once you, and I'm speaking from personal experience, once you solve some of these issues, the impacts are far ranging on your whole body and your mental well being. I mean, I, I feel better mentally when my digestion is good results in the gym too. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. There's a six, six to seven pound weight difference in me when my gut health is good versus when it's not. So I, I, I suggest finding a good gut health specialist. And it's, it's, there's a lot of testing involved. You'll probably have to do a stool test. You'll probably have to do some blood tests. And you might even have to do an you know endoscopy or whatever, depending on the situation. But totally worth it. So that's that's where I would send you first. But the digestive enzymes doesn't hurt. You can, you can throw that in. Very safe supplement. Um, and again, very inexpensive. And it, it won't hurt to try. Awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely do that. All Thanks, right. guys. Thanks, Thank Alexandra. Right. Appreciate it. You know, what's funny is that... Um, it wasn't that long ago. Maybe like, I know when we started the podcast, nobody in fitness talked about uh, digestive issues. Oh, nobody. Yeah. In fact, it was- Well, just gut Just something you worked through. Yeah. And it was actually accepted. Like, oh yeah, you eat a lot of protein. That's why, you know, whatever. Or, you know, it, it, it wasn't accepted. It wasn't um, uh, an issue that anybody talked about. Then it, people started to become aware and some people started to fix their issues and they found how profound it was. So I'm glad that people now ask these questions and are paying attention because- I think for a long time, people just took antacids or Mm -hmm. took, you know, um, stool softeners or, you know, uh, things for diarrhea and they just took them regularly thinking this is just the way I am. Um, And no, there's a root cause for all that stuff. Well, what I find amazing too is that I I think a lot of people don't realize how much it can play a factor in your results too. I mean, it it could be slowing down your results as far (laughs) as fat loss. It could be slowing down... Mm -hmm. Uh, it can your, affect your metabolism. Yes. For sure. Oh, yeah. Your performance and your strength. Like, 
if uh, if your body is having to work overtime to fix issues that are going on in your gut, it doesn't have the energy and resources to go and help you build muscle or help your metabolism speed up, right? So same difference. So if if you don't address that and then you're just kind of piling, oh, what's the latest fat burner? Oh, what's the best, yep. you know, muscle building supplement? You're just trying all these other things versus why don't we why don't we get to the bottom of Let's what's get going healthy on? First. Yeah, get healthy first <coughs> and then, you know, like we say, chase health and the aesthetics will follow. Yeah, I mean, nutrient deficiencies are common with people with gut health issues and they'll take supplements and everything yeah. and find out why am I lacking vitamin B or D or whatever? Your gut is not absorbing it. It's a big deal. Our next caller is Sean from Minnesota. Sean, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, how's it going, guys? Thank you, Sal. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so uh, I have a question about LDL cholesterol. And um, just to give a little bit of a background, um, so I'm someone who uh, I'm a pretty big guy. I work out a lot to the point where I almost overtrain. Um, I'm about six foot two, 200 pounds. Uh, I've worked out basically every day since high school, so about 15 years now. And um, because of that, I, I eat a lot of calories. I mean, I eat around 4,000 calories a day just to maintain weight. Um, I've also determined that um, eggs are probably the main source of protein that works best for my digestive system. And in about May of 2021, I started tracking my macros to try to put on some more muscle. Um, and it's worked. I put on probably about five pounds of muscle. I have not increased my waist circum circumference. Um, the problem is my LDL cholesterol. So I had labs drawn in July of 2021. And my LDL cholesterol was very good. It was 78 milligrams per deciliter, which is well under the 100, but they recommend you, you stay under. Then after that, I increased where I was eating a lot of eggs, probably about eight eggs per day with yolks on average and a little bit more red meat throughout the rest of 2021. I had labs drawn again in December and my LDL was 146, but it shot up. It was pretty high. And then of course, after that, I said, okay, you know, I need to go more either you know, plant-based, whatever. Um, and I guess I heard something, um, I believe Sal, you said in the episode recently about the eight worst people to take diet advice from. You mentioned something, I think I'm paraphrasing here about how uh, LDL cholesterol, high LDL cholesterol alone is not necessarily, you know, that much of a, a big deal if you don't have other risk factors. And so I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that a little bit and kind of what your take is on my my situation. Yeah, sure, Sean. So first off, I want to say, obviously, I'm not a doctor um, and this is not mm -hmm. my field of expertise. So my expertise is in fitness. So what I'm going to comment on now is coming from somebody who's a fitness expert, um, not a doctor. Okay. So I'm not an expert mm -hmm. in this, but there's sure. a, there's a context that is typically looked at when you're assessing risk, LDL is part of that picture, but you have LDL HDL ratio. You have your um, you have other lipids that they're looking at in your blood, your blood sugar, um, body weight, and then LDL can also be broken up into different types of LDL. Some mm -hmm. are more damaging, others uh, now they're talking about being more protective. The total LDL number can also matter. So at some point, if it just gets too high. Um, then, then that's something that is cause uh, also for concern. And then finally, there's this really interesting variant between people or ge genetic variant or whatever you want to call it, or how people react to saturated fat intake. Like uh, I'll use a couple personal examples. I eat, you know, I eat up to 12 egg yolks a day. Most of the meat that I eat is saturated fat. My LDL is always uh, under 100. My total cholesterol is borderline too low. Now, Doug uh, is somebody that, you know, obviously, you know, Doug, our producer, he reacts very differently to saturated fat and he has mm -hmm. to actually control it a little bit because it can have some, what would look like adverse effects on his blood lipids. So it depends on the person as well. Um, now, my comment on that show was, was simply this, was when there's one blood marker, unless it's really bad, it doesn't tell you nearly as much as what the whole picture is, right? You got to look at mm -hmm. everything to kind of make more of an accurate assessment. And I think really good doctors who are experts in this field will tell you that. So that's what that's what I would look at. And I would talk to your doctor about those things. Do you think that uh, Dr. Ran and Dr. Todd would cover a subject like this inside our hormone? Now form? those are, they're hormone specialists. Um, now they are, they're very knowledgeable, they are though. somewhat knowledgeable about, about cholesterol because it, it's something that can get affected uh, with hormones. So you could try asking them but I would, uh, I would speak specifically to somebody who's an expert um, in this field because 
there's a lot we're learning about this. Like I, like what I said earlier about different types of LDL. This was mm-hmm. barely discussed just like seven years ago. It was just LDL. And then we discovered, wow, there's smaller, denser particle LDL mm. molecules. And then there's mm-hmm. those that are Big larger and particles. fluffier. And one is more damaging. The other one tends to be more protective. LDL in general is associated with protecting you from infection and illness. So it's also essential. Um, so like having mm-hmm. it too low isn't, isn't good from what I've read. Um, but it's it, there's a lot of complexity to this, and I would look at all of these things. So, um, and I would talk to somebody who's an expert. Well, so, so I, that's what I was going to ask you. Then, if you if you were not to just defer to a general practitioner doctor, who would you defer to? That maybe who we know that you think could be able to dive into his labs a lot better than because that's the only this is the problem with the the GP right here, right? They see that, and then yeah. their first thing right away is, oh, let's fix that. Let's get let's get that lower. Uh, you not- know, Doctor Stephen Cabral uh, has got some pretty good takes on mm-hmm. on cholesterol numbers, blood lipids, uh, the context of the whole thing, triglycerides. Right, that's something else you want to pay attention to. Um, he's somebody that's really good. Um, but I would bring these exact questions up to your doctor and say, okay, uh, what's the right ratio of HDL to LDL? I mm-hmm. would say, um, can I do a test to determine what kind of LDL? particles that I have to see what the difference is and is my LDL mm-hmm. so high that none of that matters or am I within the range where I can look at the whole context of things and, and pay attention it's a lot less clear or I should say obvious than it used to be you know it used to be oh you know over 200 cholesterol was really bad and then we saw these long-term studies that showed that people with higher cholesterol in some cases live longer mm-hmm. people with higher LDL tend to get less infections <clears throat> so my point is it's with what I said was we used to look at like a single number and be like, oh, good or bad, but it's way more complex than that. Right. It wasn't the fear of, you know, potentially that leading to heart attacks and, and you know, sort of epigenetically unlocking, you know, some of these problems down the road. Is that still like something that's a very, you know, real fear that, uh, you know, doctors are- Yeah. To- and, I, and I know LDL, if it gets too high, everything else, you know, the context of everything else can look whatever it wants and it still might not necessarily be a good thing. Um, but it's like I said, it's kind of, no, and it's, I've heard conflicting information yeah. about it now. So it's it, tough to, it's answer. really weird how some people react to saturated fat, uh, in terms of their lipid numbers and how, I mean, I'm, I, I said, I'm a perfect example. I literally eat like a red meat probably twice a day, three times a day, egg yolks yeah. up the yin yang. I eat, I mean, a lot of my fat is saturated and my blood lipid numbers are almost too low. Like my cholesterol is almost too low hmm. so it's it's very interesting so that's so i would like i said i would ask an expert those questions specifically you know i like to, i know the ratio is a makes a big difference of hdl ldl then there's a ratio of those to your total your triglycerides you know play a role and then the type of ldl that you have i know all those things now right. are starting to show that they're you know that they i would just to- caution taking the you know if it's the general practitioner that he's talking to and 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 referring back to him i would just caution that uh, i don't know uh, his extent and and I, I think if you ask those questions you'll know like yeah. hey what are my ldl can i get a test that shows me what kind of ldl yeah, well, uh, I don't know. I don't think there is one. Like, then you know, okay, I might need to find someone that you know really looks a little deeper. At yeah, this. if I was back when I was training, I always had like a, a doctor that I knew because I, I had trained one, and then I'd keep them on on tabs because this is something I would defer. Right, I would. This is not my level of expertise, but I know enough and experienced enough where I've had healthy, really healthy clients still test high like this. So finding somebody that is more or that's well versed in this besides just their because a lot of times they would come with their from their recommendation from their doctor saying, hey, my doctor says my cholesterol is too high. And they would just give me some number and say, that's all you were told. Nothing else. What about all these other markers? Well, okay, let me refer you over to my buddy over here. Yeah. Go get it ran and ask these questions and see. Yeah. Well, part of the problem, Sean, it was that Mm -hmm. and this this was from doctors that I trained. They actually told me this, that they said, you know, one of the issues is. We invented a pharmaceutical drug that was so effective at lowering cholesterol. Like you take a statin and it will lower your cholesterol. Yeah. And so what happened was because we had something that was really effective, that was easy, you just take a pill, that they focused really hard on that because it was something so easy to yeah, treat. Everything became a nail. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. And um, and so that was, I guess, part of the issue. But we know now that it's a little bit more complex um, than that. So I, and again, the genetic factor is huge, man. Some people are very, they have to really reduce saturated fat intake and even have to 
reduce total fat intake. There's a small percentage of people that still mm-hmm. have to do that. Um, so it depends. So again, I would yeah. I would find I would go to your doctor and ask all these specific questions and see if, if you get the answers you're looking for. And if not, then find somebody who, who yeah, does And if you're not following already, uh, Dr. Stephen Cabral, I think that's his Instagram too, right? Yeah, S T E P H. I think Stephen with a P H. Yeah. Cabral. Okay. You said, I'm sorry, Stephen, is it Cabral? Was yeah. Stephen C- Cabral. C A B R A L. You could actually go okay, back. Cabral. We did it. We did an interview with him on here. So it was a really good interview. Yeah. I, we might've actually touched on cholesterol with him. I think we did. Yeah. I think we did touch on cholesterol with him. So that's a, that'd be a good episode to listen to anyways. He's actually got a podcast too, that it does really, really well. And I think he does like we do where he field questions. So he mm-hmm. would just, he would be a great follow uh, in general, I think for, for these types of questions. Okay. Perfect. And what what were the names of the other? There was a couple other doctors you guys had mentioned. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did we mention more right now? For right, not right Dr. now. Dr. Ruscio, maybe. No no no, 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 no. We didn't. Re- we didn't recommend. Yeah, that's okay. Maybe it was medicine. just Cabral. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we we have doctor friends for specific things like you know uh, Jolene Brighton and uh, also Dr. Ruscio and uh, but Stephen Becky Dr. Campbell. Cabral would probably be. Yeah, we have like that. We recommend for like gut health, you know, functional mm-hmm. medicine. So it kind of depends. But Cabral is uh, up your alley for what you're asking. Oh, right? Doctor Allo. He's also he's a he's a okay. yeah uh, yeah he's a he's a cardiovascular oh, right, right, specialist. Right. So. Um, he was on a podcast as well, Doctor A A L O. I was I trying to think of him. Yeah, yeah he's also somebody. Might want okay, to talk perfect. To. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I listen to this, I'll I'll remember what we said and then and then look those look those doctors up. So, um, yeah. Um, if we've got um just a couple more minutes here, I was just going to say, yeah, I kind of actually heard the same type of thing when I was reading um in Ben Greenfield's book Boundless. He actually had a section about that where he talked about some of the same thing, how it really comes down to the different types of LDL particles, and so it's, there's a lot more to it than just you know. HDL, LDL. Right. Um, and then I guess just one last question. So with the, um, you know, with the, the testing, you've talked about, um, Sal, a lot about how um, different body types, you know, different genetic types, we react differently to saturated fats. So can they test for that at a typical, you know, in a typical clinical setting? I don't think so. I think the way you know is you- By teasing it out. Yeah, you tease it out. Like I use Doug, Doug as an yeah. example. Him and I if we ate the same diet, our blood lipids would look very different. Um, so okay. I think that's really the only way at this point. Okay. All right. Thanks for calling, well, Sean. Yeah, I appreciate it very much, guys. Thank no you. Problem. Thank you. Going? Yeah, gone are the days of just, ah, cholesterol over 200 is bad for you. And, you know, yeah. LDL is always bad. Well, I mean, it's God, way more. Lower it. Here's the medicine. Yeah, the, it's the way more The unfortunate part, complex. though, is gone. The days are not gone. They're still getting general practitioners that still talk like this. Yeah. That that's all they say. Oh, it's high. Let's get it down. Yeah. Here, take the statin. You know, yeah. or oh, we need to change your diet up right away versus looking at all the all the factors. So, you know, I find that I still get stuff like this, but I, I know damn well that I'm not an expert in this. Like, this is not my field of expertise, and I know there's such yes. a individual Bio indiv- individuality. Yeah, yeah. I have fun, I have a lot of fun with this because I'll when I get my blood work when I used to I don't do this anymore, but I used to have fun with it. And before I would get the results, doctor would test my blood. And I'd say, yeah, I'm interested in seeing what my my numbers look like. I eat about 12 eggs a day, and I eat probably one to two pounds of red meat every day. And the look on their face is always like, <laughs> I, I suck know. on butter cubes. Yeah, they're always like, oh my god, like, oh, this is going to be really bad. And then they get the numbers, and they're like, uh, your cholesterol, your total, Do you sweat mayonnaise. Yeah, your total cholesterol is 163 or whatever. Like, uh, this doesn't make any sense. You know. Our next caller is Christina from California. Hey, Christina, how can we help you? Hi. Um- I have a question. I've been doing some workouts on my own recently. I used to go to a gym, but it got closed during um, the pandemic. And I'm noticing that I am losing out on power. And I think it's because of speed. I haven't noticed as much of a drop off in my strength, but power is not where I want it to be. And I have an upcoming Highland Games competition this summer. So I'd really like some suggestions on how specifically to work on power and speed. Ooh, I love this question. Okay, so um, power is strength that's fast, right? So for people watching right now, like what's the difference between power and speed, or excuse me, power and strength? Strength is- Explosive speed. Yeah, it's it's a big, it's like how far I could, you know, or how fast I could deadlift a weight versus how heavy I could deadlift a weight or something along those lines. It's quite specific, meaning you have to train for it. So the way you would train for power is by using a submaximal load, training it at full speed, um, you know, or explosive power, and lots of rest in between sets, and not doing it to fatigue. So you're not trying to do it to fatigue the body, 
but rather you're doing it to try to get yourself to be able to move faster. Very unlike CrossFit esque. Very yes. unlike. Yeah, you're not doing it to fatigue you at eliminate all. Eliminate fatigue. Fatigue is your enemy uh, with anything uh, that you're trying to do power wise. And you know the best approach to this, obviously, with the Highland Games, there's very specific types of. Um, what do you call those? Like different type events. of events that that you know you you get. I, I know the caber toss is one of them. The hammer throw. I, I don't know all of them, but I know they all. Right. Are. There are nine different events. Right. All throwing heavy objects um, for distance or height. Okay. Uh, the, it, the haggis throw. That's yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it's obviously it's going to be hard to kind of emulate those specifically, but you can do that with kettlebells, like uh, you know something that you could you could uh, apply in your programming where you really just take the time to. Um, work on you know the technique of not just like the swings and getting the hip hinging snapping power out of your hips but also then you know releasing and then throwing the kettlebell out in a field as a great exercise to apply uh, you know specifically for that but really the the, the point is with anything power it, it requires all the, the the intent going into it all the attention you know no fatigue and to be able to you know recover and then produce that same amount of immediate force production. Christina, how, how have you been training, how you train currently right now, or have you trained in the past to get ready for something like this? So I certainly do some event specific training. Uh, so I have some field stones and I have um, a 16 pound hammer and a lighter hammer. So I do practice the events as much as I can. Um, I don't have a convenient caber. So that one I have to trust to cleans and things to work on. Um, but then I do try to supplement um, at home. So I've been mostly doing probably the lifts that I, I enjoy the most, things like um, presses and squats uh, and deadlifts. But I've been trying to do a little bit more power lifting, more cleans and things like that um, to supplement that uh, event specific work. So more specifically, what is like the, the like the training blocks? What I mean is, okay, so obviously you're doing great exercises uh, that you should be doing. Does it look like what Justin's saying, where you do a a rep or two and then rest and then a rep, or are you and, doing, doing it fast? Or are you doing things where you got ten to fifteen reps and then you're also supersetting that with a run around the block or pull ups or other things like that? How how is the programming look? Right. So um, I would say. I guess I've fallen into the trap of, of wanting to measure my progress. And the easiest way for me to do that is to see what I'm able to do for sets of five or 10 or something like that. So maybe I've been, um, you know, trying to get to a heavy set of five or a heavy set of 10 in one of those lifts. Yeah. So strength will contribute to power, but if mm -hmm. you don't train specifically for power, you're going to miss out a lot. So there's nothing wrong with getting stronger, but if you don't trade, if you don't train for speed or acceleration with a weight that's much lower than you would train for strength with, um, it's going to be hard for you to express a lot of power. Like you know, power lifters are very strong, but they're not nearly as explosive as Olympic lifters, uh, for example. So you got it. I would do some specific days on on power, on trying to throw, like Justin said, a kettlebell or mimicking the events. There's also a lot of technique involved in what you're doing. I mean, he made a good point. You know, when you're doing a caber toss, you got to have a lot of power, but you also need to have a good technique and release and know where to position your body to maximize the effect. So I would do, you know, I would practice two days a week the events. Don't do them to fatigue, but really try to get further and further with your throws. A lot of rest in between, you know, your attempts. And then maybe a couple days a week of, of, of strength building and some mobility and that's yeah. pretty much it. But I, I think just practicing the power stuff is going to make a big difference. I think, and I think mass performance. So there's a phase in there where we do devote. Uh, it's one of our only programs uh, that actually does devote some time to speed power. And, you know, and this doesn't require a lot of heavy load. Obviously, this is more about moving very, very quickly uh, and also being able to recover and, and gather yourself uh, and be able to control your body uh, after you, you know, explode through these types of, of movements. So uh, I think that if I have to pick any you know, program that we have that I would recommend, you know, maps performs would be one to, to figure that out. Yeah. One more example, Christina. Okay. Squatting with a barbell on your back. That's heavy. You're training for strength. 
trying to jump as high you as high as you can with no weight on you at all, just your body for one attempt would be power. Okay, does that does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so training for power is different than training for strength. Strength contributes to power, but if you don't train for power as well, you're going to miss out a lot on that specific type of performance. So you got to incorporate some days where you just focus on that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, can I ask a question, a follow up? Because I'm, I think, really bad at recovering. I'm, I'm a pretty impatient person. Mm -hmm. um, if I am changing my workouts to sort of make sure I'm resting between attempts, what are guidelines for how long I should rest? You want to feel ready to exert maximal power again. Mm -hmm. So if you do like a, a 50 yard dash, which could also be considered explosive, um, you would do it. And then you'd wait until you felt like you could push it real fast again, right? Or if I if I jump as high as I can, I'm not jumping as high as I can and then jumping again as high as I can. I'm jumping as high as I can and then I'm waiting until I feel like you're I fully can, composed again. Yeah, I can exert that power again. And what you what you'll find, here's something that's interesting. I'm glad you asked that question. When you're training for power, it's typically your third or fourth attempt that's your best. Okay, mm -hmm. so when people don't rest long enough in between, their first attempt is the best. When it comes to power, you'll do an attempt, and the second or third time, you start to fire more effectively with the muscles, and your your, your technique gets a little better, and you'll get higher. So you should be able to do better the third or fourth time. If it's getting worse by the second, third, fourth time, you're not resting long enough. That actually fits really well with my experience at competitions where we get three chances at each event. And yep. mm -hmm. just like you said, typically that third one is the best. Exactly. Because yeah. what you did is you, you waited, obviously, in between. central nervous system that. Yes. And you're just, you're able to fire more forcefully, effectively. Your body feels like it's safe to do so. But if you get no rest in between, uh, your first attempt would be your best. So keep those things in mind. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. No problem. Thank awesome. you. And good luck on your competition. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. No problem. Yeah. Um, power is probably one of the most misunderstood elements of general fitness. Nobody does it right. Yeah. I was fishing for the CrossFit thing. I see she wrote up yeah. in there that her CrossFit gym, and I was trying to see if that's how Maybe she Maybe she just works out there, but yeah, she didn't want to say that she was doing their workout specifically, which yeah. is, you know, yeah, that would... That would be, I'd have different advice for that in terms of uh, if that was what kind of protocol she was using. But um, it is, it, it, it's one of the segments of fitness that is looks the sexiest and a lot of people will just throw it into their programming kind of willy nilly. But uh, I mean, the biggest thing that is nails on chalkboard to me is when you're already in a state of fatigue and then you're going to go and run a very highly demanding uh, type of an exercise, like a power exercise. Yeah. At that point, you're just, you're just building. It just wastes stamina. the entire. Yeah. It's just building. I know my, I, I'm so glad that it came to me because I know that's kind of a telltale sign. It's like your second, third or fourth attempt should be better than the first. That's how you know you're resting long enough and you're doing it properly. Otherwise, if it's not um, that way, it's like the first attempt is good and you just get weaker and weaker with each uh, Diminishing attempt. returns. Totally. Look, if you like our information, you got to go to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal. By the way, that's with one L. There's somebody on Instagram trying to impersonate me. You poser. Mind Pump Sal, one L. If you find the person with two L's, report them. And then there's Mind Pump Adam. <laughs>